Chapter 4 of The Romance of Modern Exploration. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Piotr Nater. The Romance of Modern Exploration by Archibald Williams. Lhasa visited. The Land of Mystery. The Himalayas are remarkable for their altitude and even more extraordinary are the climatic extremes between which they form a boundary. To the south is India, a country synonymous for heat. To the north, Tibet, the very mention of which conjures up visions of biting winds, hail, snow, and ice. Of all the countries in the world, few are less inviting than the inhospitable tablelands of Tibet. Rising, as they do in places, to an average elevation of 15,000 feet above sea level, the natural cold of their great altitude is aggravated by their exposure to the icy blasts sweeping from the north over the sandy wastes of Central Asia. As a consequence, though Tibet lies between the latitude of Naples and Cairo, its climate is almost arctic in its severity, while the great mountains intervening between it and the sea rob all southerly winds of their moisture, so that during the short summers a great lack of water is experienced at a distance from the rivers and lakes which are found in the east west and south of the country wood does not rot in tibet it merely perishes of brittleness and even flesh will not putrefy where it is exposed to the winds over so vast an area great variations in climate may be expected and travellers have noticed that though the western regions are visited by very little rain the central lake district extending from the Quenlun range to the himalayas is plentifully moistened by the thunderstorms prevailing in the three summer months also while snow may be lying on the sidon passes a man may punt in the heat of the plateau south of the Quenlun, though at an elevation of sixteen thousand feet speaking generally however cold and drought are the main characteristics of tibet in spite of its repellent features this country has for several reasons been attractive to the inhabitants of more favoured lands among the hundreds of millions of buddhists living to the north east and south it is a religious centre since lhasa its capital contains in addition to several notable temples the residence of the high priest of the cult the dalai lama a visit to lhasa is therefore in the eyes of the pious buddhist a work of great merit and one undertaken in the same spirit as that which drives the strict Mussulman to Mecca, as a pilgrimage usually entails the payment of certain fees to the priesthood of the religion, the lamas or clergy of Tibet greatly encourage such journeys on the part of their co-religionists, but they evince an equal amount of hostility towards any one who comes into their country from motives of mere curiosity, under which head they include all desire for scientific exploration this policy of isolation is an inheritance from the conquest of the country by the chinese which commenced in the thirteenth century and may be said to have been completed in or about the year seventeen twenty when the whole of tibet became a tributary dependency of the celestial empire the ambans or chinese governors inculcate in all classes the same aversion to outsiders which has made china proper a risky home for the foreign devil though as in china the upper classes, from motives of self-interest, are much more bigoted than the poorer population. Dr. Hedin was told by the Tibetan authorities that all they desired was to be let alone. Of European civilization they knew little beyond the fact that it would have evil consequences to the country if once introduced. The jealousy of the Tibetans towards Europeans is supposed to date from 1791 to 1792 when English soldiers were believed to have taken part in the war which followed the incursion of the Gorkhas into Tibet. And as the English government, then in its infancy, took no step to cultivate the friendship of the Tibetans, that feeling took a lasting hold on their minds. This is the opinion of Sarat Chandra Das, who also mentions a belief, universally held in Tibet, that within two hundred years the whole world will succumb to the power of the Russians and English, thanks to their more potent gods and intellect in 1840 there was war between tibet and nepal on this occasion the tibetan gods did what was expected of them the nepalese were driven out and compelled to pay tribute 
Furthermore, the trade routes through the Himalayas were closed, lest the opening up of commerce with India should prejudice that already established with China, out of which lamas, nobles, and Chinese officials make a remarkably good thing. The staple trade is in tea, as dear to the Tibetan as to the Russian. Tea of six qualities is imported. The first, extra superfine, for the Dalai Lama and a few other privileged individuals. The other five standards steadily fall, to a substance composed chiefly of the wooden parts of the tea plant, mingled with just enough tea leaves to justify its name. This is known as Yong Ma, and fetches three shillings in Lhasa, to which place it is carried on the backs of sturdy porters, whose strength or skill is equal to a load of three hundred pounds. For transportation, the tea is done up into packets of about twenty-two pounds each, which are placed evenly one above the other, the upper ones projecting so as to come slightly over the porter's head. They are held tightly together by little bamboo stakes and coir ropes. A sling, also made of coir, holds the load on his back, and a string is fastened to the top of it, by means of which he balances it. A short, strong wooden crutch is used by all porters to assist them along the steep mountain roads and to put under their loads when they want to rest without taking them off their backs. Women frequently carry seven or eight packages of tea, and I have seen children of six or seven with a package, or a package and a half, trudge along behind their parents. The government of Tibet is dual. On the political side are the Ambans, commanders of the army and the supreme authorities on all points affecting the suzerainty of china the salaries of the ambans together with the expense of maintaining the army come out of taxes levied on the tibetans who entertain no great fondness for their temporal lords and masters internal affairs and spiritual matters are nominally at last in the hands of the dalai lama and a council of five four noble laymen and one lama until a dalai lama reaches his majority eighteen years he is represented by a regent, himself chosen from among the heads of the four greatest monasteries. Spiritually, the Dalai Lama is considered the equal of the Panchen Rinpoche, who lives in the great convent of Tashilunpo, near the town of Shingatse, on the Brahmaputra, west of Lhasa. But the meanings of their respective titles, the priest as wide as the ocean, and the right reverend great teacher Jewel, show the actual superiority of the Dalai who is practically the ruler of the richest part of Tibet. One of the main articles in the Lamaist creed is the belief in reincarnation, the reappearance of a soul in bodily form time after time. Closely allied with it is the belief in transmigration, whereby a human soul may be condemned by the gods to put on for one or more lifetimes the form of a lower animal. When a lama dies, it is taken for granted that he will reappear in human guise by virtue of his holiness, and it becomes the duty of his surviving fellows to determine in which child he is reincarnated, unless on his deathbed he has left convenient hints as to the family which he intends to honor. In the case of so great a person as the Dalai or Panchen, a physical sign, the lack of a kneecap, etc., betrays the reborn saint, and if several children all answer to the desired description, a solemn decision must be made by the casting of lots. The names are sent in to the regent for examination, and written on pieces of paper, which are enclosed in balls of paste. These are placed in a golden jar and presented for a week on the altar of the chief temple of Lhasa. The jar is on the eight-day twirled round till a name has come out three times, the possessor of which is brought to Lhasa and subjected to certain tests. The reborn art saint, usually a boy of five years old, is questioned as to his previous career, books, garments, and other articles used and not used by the deceased are placed before him to point out those who belonged to him in his former life. But however satisfactory his answers be, they do not yet suffice. Various little bells required at the daily devotions of the Lama are put before the boy to select that which he did use when he was the Dalai Lama or Panchen. But where is my own favorite bell? the child exclaims after having searched in vain and this question is perfectly justified for to test the veracity of the reborn saint this particular bell had been withheld from him 
Now, however, there can be no doubt as to the Dalai Lama or Panchen being bodily before them. The believers fall on their knees, and the Lamas, who successfully performed all these frauds, join them in announcing the momentous fact. So far so good, but the Emperor of China has to sanction the election, and if the child happens to be a member of a loyal family, assent is given. If otherwise, some irregularity will be discovered to prove the choice invalid. So that here we have a close parallel to the congé de lire given to our own clergy when a bishopric falls vacant. They may choose him whom the sovereign has already chosen. In addition to the two archbishops, or popes as we may regard them, is a great host of reincarnated lamas, and lamas who cannot claim a previous existence, but who hope by meritorious work to attain a pitch of holiness which will fit them for future rebirths. These are collected into huge convents containing as many as four thousand inmates. Chinese writers of authority, says Mr. W. W. Rockhill, have stated that for every family in Tibet there are three lamas, and I do not believe that this is an exaggerated estimate. Their command of nearly all the wealth of the land, and the hold that they have over the community in all matters connected with marriage and burial, makes them everywhere the masters, under the Chinese, of the country. Like the great ecclesiastics of the Middle Ages, they are by no means lovers of peace, when anything is to be gained by war, exchanging their kilts for trousers, and their praying wheels for lance and bow. They mount their steeds and go out to fight taking their dependents with them. In the actions which the British mission to Lhasa has fought with the Tibetan forces, the Lamas have been well to the front, encouraging by example and compelling by threats. Very many attempts, most of them unsuccessful, have been made by Europeans or outsiders in the service of Europeans to penetrate to Lhasa. As early as 1328, a friar is said to have reached the holy city from China. 350 years later, Fathers Dorville and Grube were equally successful, and between 1700 and 1750 A.D. several other Capuchins entered the capital from the Indian frontier. The only Englishman who has hitherto got through is Thomas Manning, in 1811, and his stay was brief. The last Europeans to enter Lhasa were the French missionaries Uc and Gabet in 1844. Since that date, many explorers have tried to add their names to the list of the favored few, but with the exception of three Indian pandits, Nain Singh, Kischen Singh, and Sarat Chandra Das, they have shared the fate of Dr. Hedin, and been turned back by the ever-watchful subjects of the Dalai Lama. These men were the emissaries of the Indian government, their duty being to survey, with all possible accuracy, such parts of Tibet as they should traverse. The most extensive results came from the expeditions of Kischen Singh, officially known as A.K., who in four years crossed Tibet from north to south and from east to west, and among other things managed to draw out a detailed plan of Lhasa. He was obliged, when in the company of natives, to play the part of a peddler, and to conceal his scientific instruments in a roll of cloth. His survey is considered to be very accurate. A year or two after his return to India, Sarat Chandra Das, a native of Chittagong in eastern Bengal, made the first of two interesting journeys into Tibet. While headmaster of the Darjeeling school, he formed a friendship with a lama, Ugyen Gyatso, who in 1878 obtained permission from the chief minister of the Panchen Rinpoche to take Chandra Das with him into Tibet, where the pundit's name was entered as a theological student in the Grand Monastery of Tashilunpo. Setting out in June 1879, accompanied by the Lama, he reached Tashilunpo safely and remained there six months to study the fine collection of Sanskrit and Tibetan books in the convent library. On the outward and homeward journeys, he explored the hitherto unknown country to the north and northeast of Kunchinjinga, and the data thus obtained have proved of great value. He fortunately found in the minister, as he calls him in his narrative, a man whose ideas were more enlightened than those of brother Lamas, and who was anxious to make acquaintance with the civilization against which his countrymen set their faces. Chandra Das was invited by him to make a second visit to Tashilunpo. Accordingly, in November 1881, he again set his face towards Tibet. Ugyen Gyatso went with him as his secretary and collector. 
In his narrative of a journey to Lhasa, Chandra Das gives a full description of what he did and what he saw. So interesting is the story that the reader will be glad to learn some of its most graphic details. For fourteen months Das went among the Tibetans, noting their peculiar customs, visiting their chief towns, including Lhasa itself, monasteries and temples, and gathering all kinds of useful information. At Tashilumpo he gained an insight into the methods of Chinese government. The junior Amban was on the yearly tour of inspection of the guards of the Nepal-Tibet frontier. According to law, the people through whose villages he passed were supposed to furnish him with a daily salary of about thirty-five pounds. Arriving at Shigatse, the town nearest to Tashilumpo, he suddenly demanded fifty-four pounds a day, which was refused by the enraged populace. The chief magistrates were at once caught and flogged, an act that drew on the Amban volleys of stones, from some of which he received severe wounds. Troops appeared on the scene, arrested the ringleaders, and sent post-haste for the senior Amban. The latter soon arrived with his suite to judge and punish the refractory magistrates. The village headman received four hundred strokes of the bamboo and two months' imprisonment, while the two mayors of Shigatse, in addition to degradation, had the flesh stripped of their hands. No wonder that the Chinese are somewhat unpopular among the Tibetans. One day Das observed a prominent citizen, Lakpat Sering, distributing alms of one anna each to a crowd of cripples and beggars. This man had been a silversmith, and by industry amassed great riches. To gain merit he made princely gifts to the Tashilumpo monastery, but unfortunately he overdid the business by offering a very saintly lama a sum of about one hundred and twenty pounds, in addition to many valuable articles, in hope that his generosity would have an earthly reward. The saint, so far from being grateful, refused the present, and said, In a previous existence you were a great sinner, and in your next you will be a crocodile. Horrified by the terrible prospect, Lakpa implored pardon for his sin, asking how he could make atonement. From henceforth, replied the holy man, on every new moon you must give alms to the poor and helpless till you die. This will save you from becoming a crocodile, and also gain you immense wealth. Lakpa took him at his word, and, from all we know, may still be distributing a percentage of his income. It is satisfactory to learn that the action of the Lama had a good effect on the commercial morality of the place, though the merit of the almsgiving is in our eyes somewhat discounted by the fact that Lakpa was distinctly advised to throw a sprat to catch a whale, the object with which he originally approached the Lama. The candidate for Lamaism, when admitted to a convent, gains merit by a present of sixpence a head to his future companions, who may count four thousand souls. To this formidable expense must be added handsome presents for the Dalai and the College of Incarnate Lamas. During his first year of novitiate, he is expected to learn by heart one hundred and twenty-five pages of selected passages from the holy books. These he must repeat without a single mistake if he is to retain his allowances and his rights to residence. The sacred books are often of huge size, some pages measuring as much as eight by four feet, and even if the novice is left off with a paltry couple of square feet to the page, his memory needs to be a good one, and his nerve to be steady when he comes up for his viva voce. Sometimes he blunders, and then is shown the door, saddened by the thought of so much wasted labor. Candidates from outside the bed have the advantage of a three years period of study before examination. The Buddhist religion is surprisingly mechanical. Prayers are offered, not said, by attaching a slip of paper on which the prayer is written to the outside of a wheel turned by hand, wind, or water power. Every rotation means so much more merit gained by the owner of the wheel. By taking due advantage of a high wind, he lays up a fine store against a rainy day. When gas illumination reaches Tibet, there will be a good opening for the further increase of merit for by the exercise of a little ingenuity a prayer may be turned off with every cubic foot of gas passed, and the counter will tell the householder just where he stands under this particular heading. Rich men employ lama labor to read through the 108 volumes that compose the Tibetan canon, since reading by proxy is very meritorious. A band of lamas are collected and armed with teapots. 
The 40,000 pages of the sacred books are then equally distributed among them. They gobble them off as fast as they possibly can, having recourse to the teapots as soon as they get dry, which, from the nature and subject of their task, we may imagine to be pretty often. Lamas are not allowed to smoke, otherwise they would probably stipulate for a supply of cigarettes. A not less effective way of earning merit is to cut the prayer Om Manech Pad Mehum on the face of a rock or religious memorial. Some pious Buddhists spend their whole lives in this interesting occupation. It has the advantage over the other methods that it leaves behind a visible testimony to the work done. One story, at least, that Chandra Das tells is too good to be omitted. For the Buddhist it has a useful moral lesson. A saint once saw his wife steal a piece of amber from the wallet of a beggar staying in the house and substitute an apple. He lectured her by means of the following. In ancient India there lived two friends, the one honest as could be, the other dishonest. One day, while walking through a valley, they found a bowl filled with gold dust, which the honest man proposed to divide equally, after due things had been returned to the gods. The dishonest man suggested that they had done enough for that day, and that he should house the bowl till the morrow, when matters could be proceeded with. Next day the contents of the bowl, much of the surprise of dishonesty, had in some mysterious manner been changed to sawdust. Honesty saw through the fraud, but dissembled. Before leaving for home, he besought his friend to loan him his two sons to help eat up the delicious fruit that grew abundantly in his garden. To this dishonesty and his sons gladly agreed. When he reached home, honesty bought a couple of monkeys and trained them to answer to the names of the sons and come out of the house when called. He then wrote to his friend, saying that his two darlings had been changed into monkeys and asking him to come and see for himself. Sure enough, when the father arrived and uttered the names of his two boys, out ran the monkeys and climbed into his lap. In his distress he admitted his crime and offered to divide the stolen gold. Whereupon, of course, honesty told him that the sons were busily engaged in the orchard. There the story might well end. But the gods, who evidently possessed no sense of humor, could not tolerate deceit. The Lord of Death decreed that this honesty should spend five hundred years in hell, and honesty be born a monkey during as many existences, for the crime of stealing human beings. This really seems hardly fair. The minister, in return for his hospitality, was coached by Chandra Das in English and arithmetic. Like most Orientals, he studied the stars, and having seen the constellations marked on stellar maps with the form of the figures by which they are named, such as Great Bear or Orion, marked round them, he bought a large telescope that he might see the figures which he believed to be actually existent in the sky. He also showed much interest in telegraphy and photography, but here, as Chandra Das honestly admits, little help could be given, and the pundit, after the manner of a non schoolmaster, tried unsuccessfully to hide his ignorance by a multitude of words. The good old minister saw through the device, but entertained no grudges on account of it, as he took steps to clear the way for Das's visit to Lhasa, the consummation of his journey. On the way Das fell ill, and in order to evade suspicion of his real character, he permitted the usual rites of healing to be observed. These were 1. Reading of the holy books for two days by twelve monks. 2. Offerings of wafers for gods, demigods, and spirits. 3. Offerings to the Genai presiding over a quiet mind and peaceful dreams. 4. To deceive life and death by offering substitutes, five hundred fish. These rites, and some medicines, restored the pundit to health. On the last day of May he reached Lhasa. The most interesting event of his short sojourn there was his presentation to the Dalai Lama at the palace of Potala, built on a rock outside the city. The audience chamber, on the roof of the building, which is nine stories high, was reached after the ascent of three flights of stairs and fourteen ladders. What followed will be best described in the traveller's own words. Walking very softly, we came to the middle of the reception hall, the roof of which is supported by three rows of pillars, four in each row, and where light is admitted by a skylight. 
The furniture was that generally seen in lamasseries, but the hangings were of the richest brocades and cloths of gold. The church utensils were of gold, and the frescoing on the walls of exquisite fineness. Behind the throne were beautiful tapestries and satins hanging, forming a great canopy. The floor was beautifully smooth and glossy, but the doors and windows, which were painted red, were of the rough description common throughout the country. Presents having been offered, the company sat round on rugs. The Grand Lama is a child of eight, with a bright and fair complexion and rosy cheeks. His eyes are large and penetrating, the shape of his face remarkably Aryan, though somewhat marred by the obliquity of his eyes. The thinness of his person was probably due to the fatigue of the court ceremonies, and to the religious duties and aesthetic observance of his estate. Note. Since 1800 no Dalai Lama has attained his majority of 18 years. End of note. A yellow meter covered his head, and its pendant lappets hid his ears. A yellow mantle draped his person, and he sat cross-legged with joined palms. The throne on which he sat was supported by carved lions and covered with silk scarves. Tea and rice were served, and after, grace distributed among those present. The guests then withdrew, receiving, as a parting gift, packets of blessed pills. Smallpox had broken out in Lhasa. As a cause of death, it is particularly dreaded, since the victim is believed to go straight to hell. From prudential motives, Chandra Das cut short his visit and returned to Tashilumpo, in time to be there at the time of the Panchen Rinpoche's death. He was invited to attend the invalid and prescribe for him, but refused, probably with good reason, as the Panchen's doctors were flogged after the death of their distinguished patient. The burial, if so it may be called, of a corpse by the Tibetans is to merely cast it out to be devoured by vultures or dogs. The bodies of incarnate lamas are sometimes cremated, and their ashes placed in a tomb, and more rarely embalmed. A very great personage may be food to vultures, the officiating priest cutting up the body into small pieces, which are flung to the foul birds. If many vultures come to share the feast, it proves that the dead was very virtuous, whereas a small attendance betrays a sinful life. Before the partition begins, a slit is made in a certain region of the skull, lest the spirit should pass out some other way and enter a state of damnation. Murder is punishable by a fine, varying in value according to the importance of the slain. Thieves have to pay a fine of from one hundred to seven times the value of the thing stolen, according to the social position of the person from whom the thing is stolen. The harborer of a thief is considered a greater offender than the thief himself, and one who steals a key or lock is considered to have stolen what it guards. When a person has bought an article with which he is dissatisfied, he may return it the same day for nine-tenths of its value, on the next day for four-fifths, on the second day for one-half, and after the third day not at all. Two kinds of ordeal are employed in the trial of persons charged with certain serious crimes, the ordeal by fire and the ordeal by water. In the first case, the accused has to carry away a red-hot stone, as large as an ostrich's egg, for a few paces in his bare hands. In the second, he must pick a pebble out of a cauldron of boiling oil or water. If his hands suffer little injury, he is held innocent. If they blister badly, he is condemned. The tests are almost precisely similar to those employed in Europe during the Middle Ages. Polyandry, the marriage of one woman to several husbands, prevails in some parts of Tibet, especially in the agricultural. Mr. W. W. Rockhill considers the custom to have arisen from the extreme difficulty of maintaining a large number of families in the small districts where agriculture is possible. Among the nomadic Tibetans, whose flocks are constantly increasing, monogamy and, rarely, polygamy is the rule. Chandra Das returned to India in January 1883, and in consideration of his valuable services was created a companion of the order of the indian empire besides receiving a pecuniary grant from the royal geographical society his visits to tibet had a tragic sequel soon after his departure from tashilumpo the minister or sinchen lama was arrested by orders from lhasa imprisoned 
flogged, and flung into the Brahmaputra with his hands tied behind him. His servants, almost to a man, had their hands and feet cut off, and their eyes gouged out, and were left, till death, which the lamas say they never inflict, released them from their agony. His house and property were confiscated and remain unoccupied, and though the lama's reincarnation has appeared in a boy, it has been refused recognition by the authorities. A writer in the Times who visited the minister's home says, There is one strange thing in the lama's house which defies explanation. The central upper room is decorated with minutely drawn scenes from the life of each one of the reincarnations of the Sinchen Lama. Besides these pictured chronicles is set the seated form of the special incarnation whose life they record. The last of the series is, of course, that of Chandradas's patron. He sits conventionally, Buddha-wise, with a simpering baby face and a green nimbus round his head. Beside him are the events of his childhood and manhood. One after another, the artists set down the miracles he wrought and the good deeds by which he acquired merit, the reward of which, as a bodhisat, he was bound to renounce for the good of mankind. As he drew to the close of his work, he painted in also small written descriptions explaining the pictures. Then the lama said, Paint me also a house of such and such a sort. And he described it very clearly and in great detail. And under it paint me a river with a dead body floating in it. And the painter did so. But when he asked what description he was to put on the house and on the river, the Sinchen Lama said, Put no inscription. But he would not explain, nor say at all, why the two pictures were to be drawn. Only after his disgrace, the abbot and lamas of Dongtse recognized with awe the very house in which he was imprisoned, and the very spot where he was done to death, and there the pictures are to this day. Like other Tibetan stories, that of the Sinchen goes too far, and the worst of it is that the ending relates to a fact. End of chapter 4